Hi and welcome back to the channel. This time in the second of our series on going with solar power we'll be doing a six month review of how things have gone so far. We'll first be looking at system performance starting with how much output we've generated and comparing that to what we should expect. Then we'll cover some of the issues we've experienced ranging from system alarms to ensuring we received our export payments. Finally, we're going to consider whether it's time for an additional battery and how that stacks up in financial terms. Before we get started, however, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who subscribed or commented on the last video. Your feedback is very much appreciated. Anyhow, let's make a start. Before we dig into the data, I thought a quick recap was worthwhile. We're located in West Lancashire, in the northwest of England, not too far from Liverpool. Our system was installed in late July 2022 and comprises two banks of six Jinko 375 watt panels installed on broadly east and west facing roof pitches. We have a Solis 3.6 kilowatt hybrid inverter installed in the garage together with two Pylontech US 3000C batteries, giving us a total storage capacity of 7 kilowatt hours. In total, we paid a shade under £11,000 for the system. Before we look at the actual output figures, it makes sense to first consider what we should expect from our system. To do this, I'm using the JRC PVGIS tool created by the European Commission which I referred to in my previous video. I've put a link in the description below. Using this tool, we can generate our projected monthly energy output for each bank of panels. Adding the figures together gives us projected annual output of 3,329 kilowatt hours. Interestingly, this is marginally lower than the figure of 3,480 kilowatt hours obtained using the Energy Saving Trust solar calculator but higher than the figure of 3,141 kilowatt hours quoted by my supplier during the sales process. Combining the output for the two banks of panels together, we can graph the projected annual output for each month throughout the year as shown here. Although the output for each bank looks very similar, it seems that we should get approximately 8% higher output from the west facing bank than from the east. Simplifying the chart, and then arranging the months chronologically to flow from when the system was installed last August allows us to better compare the first eight months of actual system output. It's immediately apparent how good a month last August was, with actual output being around 22% higher than projected, and this was discussed in my last video. From September onwards through to February this year, actual output can be seen to be broadly in line with the projections, some months it's up slightly and some months it's down slightly, as should probably be expected. When we get to last month, March however, it's clear that this was a significantly poorer month, with actual output being around 16% lower than projected. When we look at the figures for March in detail, the data pulled from Solis Cloud shows that on 11 days, predominantly at the beginning of the month, the daily output was less than 5 kilowatt hours. Taking a step back, and again looking at the past eight months in general, we can see that we were able to utilise over 80% of our solar generation each month. This figure comprises both direct self-use and also energy from the batteries. In fact, for the months from October through to February, the amount we ended up exporting was never greater than 4%, and significantly less for the majority of time. I'll return to a discussion on export payments later in the video. Looking at the balance between solar generated and grid supplied kilowatt hours, it's immediately apparent that April through to September are the key generation months, which probably comes as no surprise. This is not to say that we don't generate useful amounts of power in March and October, which are both in the 40 to 50% range, but it's clear that November through January are pretty hopeless. Just for a little bit of context, we currently have gas powered central heating and hot water and as yet don't have an EV. Our total household grid supplied electricity consumption January to December 2021 was 5,124 kilowatt hours. 
which we managed to reduce to 4,265 kilowatt hours for the corresponding months in 2022. I'll include a couple of slides showing our year-on-year -year grid electricity and gas consumption and costs at the end of the video for anyone who's interested. So then, what do all these figures mean in pounds, shilling and pence? In terms of the eight months so far, the total solar value encompassing what we've utilised and what we've exported comes to around £460. Given that we hopefully have four of the best solar months to come, can we make an estimate of the solar value for the full year, August 22 to July 23? Making some assumptions and using the projected figures from the PV GIST tool for April through July, it looks like we'll be in the region of 3,386 kilowatt hours for the full 12 months, with a total value of £1,034. Clearly, this all depends on how much the sun shines. Throwing these numbers into the very simplistic payback model I originally used when evaluating the three supplier quotes, we get an estimated break-even point of approximately 10.6 years, if we exclude any allowance for maintenance costs. If we include an admittedly potentially optimistic allowance for maintenance, the break-even point moves out to 12 years. Interestingly, the figure of 10.6 years is almost identical to the highlighted figure for the northwest of England. Now, I recognise this calculation is vastly oversimplified, taking no account of factors such as loss of interest on the capital sum spent on the system, inflation, or changes in energy pricing, etc. etc. But as I discussed in the last video, the exact break even point wasn't the most important factor in our decision to go with solar. Having said that, I would be very interested to hear if anybody believes they have constructed or used a truly realistic payback model. My suspicion is that once you put all the factors in, the purely economic case for solar power becomes weaker and is mainly dependent on future energy pricing, which is probably anyone's guess. Or I'm talking rubbish. What do you think? In terms of issues with the actual system, this is the only one we've experienced so far. Seven instances of alarm code 2015 being issued by the Solis inverter. In each case, the system has recovered automatically within a very short period and then operates as normal afterwards. It was very disconcerting, however, to get the first couple of these notifications whilst we were on holiday in Europe. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Although I haven't spent as much time investigating this issue as I possibly should have, my initial understanding is that this is a BMS, battery management system related alarm, and seems to coincide with the batteries being fully charged to 100%. However, the batteries regularly get charged to 100% without this alarm being triggered, so there's obviously more to it than that. I'll aim to investigate this a little more and feed back in a later video if I find anything of interest or indeed if the issue becomes more problematic. In the meantime, if anyone has any thoughts on this, please do post a comment. The next issue relates to remote data access via the Solis Cloud web pages and mobile app. As shown here, both instances of this problem coincided with a maintenance bulletin from Solis, which I believe related to updates to the Solis Cloud platform. Although not an issue in the sense that the panels and inverter carried on operating as normal, it meant that I was unable to pull meaningful data from the system for the daily and monthly summary performance figures. Having banged on about how much I liked the graphical LCD front panel display in the previous video, it was pleasing that manually recording each day's output figures proved straightforward, albeit a bit of a pain. Although I initially reported both instances of this issue to my supplier, on the second occasion, I also reported it direct to Solis via their web-based support. Whilst I'm unclear which route actually resulted in the resolution, Solis support did respond reasonably promptly, which gives me some confidence that this route may prove quicker in the future. Oh, a woeful tale of unanswered emails, G98 no notifications and black holes. The full story would fill a complete video on its own, but we'd all be bored by the end of it, including me. 
In summary, from first applying to register for the Octopus Outgoing Export Tariff in the first week of August last year, it took until the end of October to get it set up correctly. Various emails to Octopus trying to expedite the process either went unanswered, which is unusual in my experience as they have typically been very good in this respect, or responded too poorly. It took an email direct to Greg, the CEO, to actually get things on the path to be sorted and fair dues to him for publicising his email address. To be fair, once this happened, someone from the Octopus team navigated the way to a resolution. Of course, by this time, I was greatly frustrated and blaming Octopus left, right and centre. It then transpired that the blockage in the system was that an export MPAN, Meter Point Administration Number, had not been set up by SP Energy Networks or DNO. This despite the G98 commissioning form having been sent to them by our installer back in August. Having resent the G98 form myself, the export MPAN was quickly set up and Octopus completed the outgoing export tariff process. Hooray, I could see my export meter readings in my Octopus account online. All sorted then, or so I thought. Keenly opening subsequent energy statement emails from Octopus for the next couple of months, I find there's no mention of my export readings or the corresponding payments. So, another email to Octopus. But this time, resolved promptly and my outstanding payments credited straight away. All told, from start to finish, this process took around seven months to fully resolve although a proportion of that was down to me not chasing things up as quickly as I possibly could have. I was probably just unlucky, but it certainly didn't feel like a smooth process. The moral of the story for me? Don't assume who might be the guilty party. Despite all of this, I have no hesitation in recommending you consider switching to Octopus if you haven't done so already. If you use the link shown below, both you and I will receive £50 each. And after all that effort, the sum total of my export payments for August through to February was the grand sum of £11.74. However, it is worth doing as I estimate they'll total around £72 for the full 12 months. I've previously mentioned I was considering investing in another battery. So would this now make sense rather than continuing to export any unused power? given the relatively low value of export payments? And if so, which capacity battery within the Pylon Tech range should I go for? Sticking with my assumption that we'll export around 20% of our solar output for the four remaining months of this analysis year, i.e. April through to July, based on the figures from last August, I calculated that for the 12 months in total, we will have exported around 523 kilowatt hours. The cost differential between our current incoming and outgoing tariffs is approximately 20 pence per kilowatt hour, which results in a lost value of around £103 because of exporting rather than being able to store that power. Clearly there are various assumptions in making this calculation, not least that we could store and use 100% of this power, but it serves for the purpose of a basic payback calculation. Looking at the relative costs of each of the three batteries, it's then apparent that the US 2000C, whilst offering the lowest capacity of 2.4 kilowatt hours, is probably the most appropriate solution, with a payback period of around nine years. The higher capacity options would, I think, only make more sense if combined with additional panel capacity, taking into account the capacity of the inverter itself. By now, of course, most of you will have spotted the flaw in this calculation. It assumes an equal proportion of that 523 kilowatt hours is exported each day. But we know that isn't the case. Looking back at August last year, the amount exported ranges from 0 to 8 kilowatt hours per day. So to be able to store 100% of that power on every occasion, I'd need to more than double my existing battery capacity and that just isn't going to happen. All of which means, I think, the payback period is likely to be much longer than I've calculated here. 
So what am I going to do? For now, nothing. I'd like to see what our export figures during the summer actually turn out to be in practice. We're also occasionally diverting solar power into our hot water tank via a low cost solution I installed myself, but I'll touch on that in the next video. There's also the option of Octopus Flux, but I'm not fully up to speed on that just yet, so the wallet will stay closed for now. Do you agree with my thinking, or have I got it wrong? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Well, if you've got this far, thanks very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Please do comment and subscribe if you haven't already done so. It's great to get your feedback, questions and viewpoints. Next time, I hope to be looking at whether the new Octopus Flux tariff makes any sense for our setup. And of course, we'll discuss any updates on system performance and issues during April. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, for those interested, the next couple of slides show our year-on-year -year grid supplied electricity and gas consumption and associated costs. It's pretty clear that despite reducing our consumption in both cases, the increased supply costs have had a significant overall impact on our household budget. Cheers! Hope to see you again next time.